another college friend, uh, her name was Lee, purchased a piece of property in Rimrock, mm -hmm. uh, up Rimrock closer, up the canyon towards the road that goes all the way up to Big Bear. And we would come out here on weekends when I was in dental school. Roller skating was a rage in mm -hmm. Venice, which was close enough to UCLA to spend some time sure. on the beach in skates. We would yeah. come out. To, we would come out to her property in Rimrock, which had a foundation, a concrete foundation, and we would wear skates and nothing else, and skate around in the sunshine. Oh my gosh, that's awesome! <laughs> Hi, and welcome to the Desert Lady Diaries podcast, a weekly conversation with women who found their home in the Mojave Desert. I'm Dawn Davis, and this is episode seventy-seven. If you'd like more information about the podcast, it's all at the website DesertLadyDiaries.com, and I invite you to engage with the guests, with other listeners, or me on social media, on Facebook and Instagram at Desert Lady Diaries, or on Twitter at Desert Lady Diary. Karen moved to Joshua Tree in 1986, responding to the request of a former roommate who needed a licensed dentist to keep her practice open in 29 Palms. Karen and Diane had briefly lived in the same apartment in Westwood while attending UCLA Dental School. She thought she'd be here for maybe six months. That was 33 years ago. Welcome to the podcast, Karen Tracy. Hi there. What was your first experience with desert? Joshua Tree. It was 1959. Wow. My father had just accepted a new position. We moved the family to Los Angeles from Seattle, where I spent the first five years of elementary school. So I arrived here, Los Angeles rather, to a totally new environment, knew no one, started a brand new grade school, for sixth grade. And this was a Sunday drive. Dad loved to drive the family on Sunday. Came out to Joshua Tree. He knew a husband and wife who had retired to mm. Joshua Tree. They were the parents of a friend of his from his youth in Alhambra. So that's that connection. We arrive out here on a Sunday afternoon. My sisters, uh, I have two sisters in the family car, and we visit the Garretts. And the Garretts lived on Sunburst Circle. I recognized the house when I got here decades later. I don't know who lives there now, but around back, the same little outhouse, same little shed, which in 1959 was a chinchilla farm. Oh my goodness. And I can remember my very grown-up attention to the fact that these real grown-ups were trying to introduce us to the idea that, yes, it's a chinchilla ranch and the chinchillas are not pets, this was the day of wearing furs was wow. very acceptable. And so I got to see how chinchillas were raised for the purpose of creating coats and wraps. And Wow, how did that feel? It felt pretty strange, although I remember having some deep thoughts about animal welfare and raising animals for furs and how these adults were behaving as though this should be completely acceptable and yet being very awkward about it. It was mm. it was a complicated stack of emotions and yeah. goings on. No and doubt. that shed is still there. Oh my goodness. Houses at the corner of Sunburst Circle and Sunset and that little shed is still in the backyard. Wow. I wonder I bet the current owners probably have no, no idea. idea. I'm sure. Yeah, or even owners before them depending on how long the Garretts owned the place. Uh, they were elderly, and they had retired out here after a lifetime of work with windows and window dressings. Oh, cool. And they had toggle switch curtains and shades. <laughs> which, oh, my which, goodness. Which was another remarkable thing I saw on that trip. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know if those are still in the house. Probably not. They seem a little impractical to me. Right, exactly. That's kind of a forward-thinking idea for that time, though. That's pretty wild. I had never seen it before, and they were quite proud of it. They wanted to show us every toggle switch and of how it course. worked. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> that was the visit. And then you go back to Los Angeles. You finish school. You're in UCLA Dental School. Did you make trips back in between there before uh, you moved out or um, before I, you came out to assist your friend? I did. I did. Another college friend, uh, her name was Lee, purchased a piece of property in Rimrock, uh, mm. Up Rimrock, closer, up the canyon towards the road that goes all the way up to Big Bear. 
and we would come out here on weekends when I was in dental school. Uh, roller skating was a rage in mm -hmm. Venice, which was close enough to UCLA to spend some time sure. on the beach in skates. We would yeah. come out. To, we would come out to her property in Rimrock, which had a foundation, a concrete foundation, and we would wear skates and nothing else and skate around in the sunshine. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. <laughs> How much fun. She later built on that foundation, turned it into a pretty good sized house, ended up with a husband and two boys, mm -hmm. and they had bedrooms and bathrooms and a kitchen, and uh, they spent a lot of, t in fact, I think she moved out here and had the kids in school in Yucca for at least a year. So I would come out and visit her when I could for a weekend and nice. experience desert. A lot of people end up here after weekending in the desert. That's what was going on at the time. That would be the 70s and 80s. Oh, okay. So then fast forward, you've graduated dental school, I'm assuming, when yep. your friend that had the practice said, help yep. me. Yep, and I was uh, in between jobs. I was ready to help. So you came out thinking six months. Mm -hmm. She's going to have a baby, and then I'll go do something else. I didn't leave. Right. I did go do something else, but I didn't leave, <laughs> leave the area. When you're here for six months in your mind, you're like, well, I'm just here for six months. What are some of the things that you did when you were working? Did you go into the park? Did you, because I see that you've done some climbing. Did you do climbing here at Joshua Tree? Not in the first six months. Okay. I spent the first eight months going to and from Venice Beach roller skating. Oh my gosh. I was still very in love with the roller skating scene. I had a lot of friends there. I lived in my car when I went down there. Wow. <laughs> After eight months, the desert began to really pull on me. Uh, it, was, it was beginning to look more interesting than Venice Beach, which was looking very crowded and mm. soiled and not nearly as interesting as it used to be. Mm -hmm. So then I discovered climbing in the park and really fell in love. Right. What were some of those uh, first climbing? Did you go out and did someone teach you? The first time I went to the park was with Lee and her boys and her husband. And there were cli it was um, one of the first places you can climb when you drive up from Joshua Tree into the park. And there were climbers on the rock, and the climbers had brought their bird with them. This is a big hmm. uh, raptor. Okay. A big like bird that preys on other birds. Yeah. And it was sitting, and I was transfixed. I thought, wow, this is, what are those guys doing, and what is that thing in yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Oh, my goodness. So it, it was see, it was capturing moments like that that really drew me into wanting to see more, wanting mm. to be here much more and focus on what was going on around me. Interesting, yeah. So when you started climbing, did you take, like, lessons and... Is that how it went down, or did you just meet some people and say, hey, I'm interested in doing this. Can you it help me was, learn? Or? It was all about hanging out with the boys. I see. Right. They, I was single, and there's something about boys in climbing harnesses that just kind of caught my attention. Mm -hmm. and, and they were willing to take me climbing and teach me a lot about rope management and knots and skilled climbing, what is safe and where to have your weight on your feet. Okay. Footwork, footwork is, you know, the, right. the biggest lesson you can learn and, from my experience, the hardest lesson. I went climbing a lot and I learned that there are two kinds of climbers, the climbers who get taken climbing and the climbers who take themselves climbing. Oh. And I wanted to be the latter, so I worked very hard at it and I got really good. Mm -hmm. And I spent all I spent six days a week climbing and wow. one day a week working as a dentist. That's a life. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Not a lot of people can say that. I don't no, think. no. How lucky. But there was an incident while you were climbing. How long had you been climbing when this happened? Mm, I think it was somewhere in the vicinity of three, four years. Mm -hmm. Four, five. No, four years. Four years would probably be pretty accurate, close mm -hmm. to it. Um, pilot error, which a lot of climbing accidents are. I was in a crack, and when you climb cracks, you place your own protection. And so when I fell, my protection didn't hold. It pulled out of the crack, oh, and God. I hit the ground. Wow. And I broke my back. Right. Which then spurred you into doing yoga. But what was the process like when you fell? Did the Then they had to send out rangers and people to get you, and... I had already, at that point, fallen and had a, 
a ranger uh, activated rescue, which became, to my view, something of a circus. I was out in one, in the Wonderland, and they brought a helicopter and a boat. I was beyond Barker Dam, okay. so they were going to try to get me over Barker Dam Reservoir, which was full. Okay. Uh, so they had a boat, an inflatable boat, and a helicopter. Oh my gosh! And probably two dozen. It made it into the American. They keep track of all the accidents that they respond to. The those save your life guys. Okay. <laughs> um, so my my incident made it into the annual review of accidents, and I didn't want that circus again when I fell and broke my back. So I self rescued with a broken back. I had a hero of a climbing partner at the time. You know that day and a tube of Ben Gay. So I would walk as far oh as I gosh. could, and then I would stop and bend over, lean against a rock, and he would rub Ben Gay onto my back. Whoa. And then we'd walk some more, and then I'd stop and rest. It took an hour before I could even get up off the ground. We got to the car. I drove a Volkswagen bus at the time. I got in the back, and I had him drive me to my medic's house. At the time, I was working as a medic for Joshua Tree Ambulance. It's now Morongo Basin Ambulance. Right. Did you know Kit Brooks at that time? No. No. I just interviewed her last week, and she worked as an ambulance driver. I just found that out. <laughs> it's I, so interesting. I, I asked for help to deliver my toxic dentistry at Jenny Q's last month, uh-huh. and she volunteered to help me, and that's when oh, I found out that goodness. she worked for Morongo Basin Ambulance. Oh, that's, when that's it was amazing. Yeah. Gosh. <laughs> so um, your friend drives you. We get to Dan Zach's house. He calls the ambulance because I wanted to be closer to desert. I didn't want to go to the emergency room here. I wanted to go down below. Right. So I was in Yucca Valley when we landed at Dan's house. Dan calls Joshua Tree Ambulance, and I get taken to Desert Hospital. They really didn't treat the back. I broke the left arm nine places. So oh they treated the, They treated the. You can see the wrists are very different. Oh yeah. Huh. They treated the broken arm and kind of overlooked the back. There was nothing that could be done. So for the next 10 years, I was grievously suffering. It didn't occur to me, but eventually it did. Eventually there was an angel that said, you need to, you need to do yoga. <laughs> and, and that's what got me out of pain and to where I am now, having now taught yoga for 10 years. Right, right. So how did that journey start for you? Did you just find a place to learn? It really was an angel's voice telling me I needed to do yoga. So the first thing I did was bought a book and tried to read from the book and place myself in the right shape. That wasn't ideal. I was frustrated by that because I wasn't making the kind of progress that I wanted, that I knew I could to help myself heal. So I began going to, there weren't yoga studios up I was going to say, I don't think, it's not as uh, prominent as it is now. And it, even still, it's not that prominent, but there are people that we know who do that. Yeah. There weren't then, and so I commuted to Los Angeles to take yoga Holy classes. Holy smokes. Yeah. And I studied with some of the names that are very big and popular now. I went to Hawaii with Sean Korn, and boyfriend at the time was David... Saul David Ray. There we go. Oh, yeah. Saul David Ray. I think they still, they come to Bhakti and Shakti. Sure, sure do. Yeah. They sure do. A lot of the people that come to Bhakti and Shakti were the people that I went to Los Angeles to take classes with. Wow. Bhakti and Shakti were not around no, yet, of course. No, exactly. Yeah. Eventually, there were yoga teachers out here. One of them was uh, Robin Maxwell's husband, who I studied with for straight didn't miss a class. When he oh. arrived, I studied with him yeah, Max. In a, Max in a very dedicated fashion. And yeah. w- after seven years of studying with Max, I decided I needed to take yoga teacher training, and I went to India. Mm, wow. There are a number of people that I've either taken yoga classes with or that I know who are now instructors who say the very same thing. They're like, I really wanted to up my practice, up my game, so I went to training not anticipating that I would become an instructor, and that's what happens. What do you think it is about that that then turns people into, like, I just want to better my practice, now I'm a yoga instructor. It wasn't my intention. When you can say, now I'm a certified yoga instructor, you become a magnet for people who want to employ yoga instructors, of course. Mm -hmm. It only makes sense. I had only been back from India a few days, 
when Clea, who owns the yoga studio here in town, called me and said, would you sub? My weekend teacher just left. I don't have anybody to take over. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and I was, I was terrified. It was about my practice, and all of a sudden, <laughs> right. they, all their practices are in my hands. And, yeah. and for the first few times that I taught, I didn't sleep beforehand. Because you were up thinking, how is this going to go? Did you, like, run the routine through Over your head? Over, yeah. yeah, I was <laughs> ruminating and thinking, this is, this is going to go terribly wrong. And oh, my God. No, it didn't. <laughs> so let's back up a little bit to dental school. What was your inspiration to becoming a dentist? I was being around the boys again. Oh. I married a man whose intention was to go to dental school, become a dentist. And at the time, our paths merged. We talked each other into thinking that we were going to be dentists together and live our lives happily ever after. Mm -hmm. Never happened. In fact, we were already split by the time he went to Georgetown to become a dentist. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, that's a really pivotal moment in my life, and I don't know why I chose to still become a dentist because at that opportunity it could have been any anything goes mm -hmm. all bets off that moment I go back to often wondering what was it in my environment what was it in my brain what was it that convinced me to keep studying dentistry mm. I did I went to UCLA I was very happy about that opportunity it's a rare opportunity for anybody who mm. wants to study to be a dentist I think I would have done it differently if I were me in that situation now of course sure and if it wasn't dentistry, what else would it have been? I'm not sure. I was really attracted to caring for people. Mm -hmm. So something in the field of medicine, I really loved being an EMT. Mm. I would have loved being a medic. Um, but that's a young person's job. You have to lift heavy, heavy people. Right, yeah. And the equipment, too. Sometimes you're carrying tanks of stuff or yep. boxes with all kinds of, yep. you know, yeah, medical it's, devices. It's for the youngsters. High energy. <laughs> I was one of the oldest in my dental school classes, so I would have been even older in a medic class. Mm -hmm. So when you graduated, were you thinking of going to join a practice, making your own practice, until your friend called and said, hey, I need you out here? I had a practice in mind. It was in Mendocino County, and I, I did practice there for two years. The marijuana industry wasn't what it is now, mm -hmm. and my clients would either show up with fists full of cash or no money at all and need their dentistry pro bono. Wow. It was a very thin, scary place to make a living at the time, and mm. I only, only lasted two years. I just couldn't make a living. Yeah. It was a very poor environment, a very poor town. Gotcha. So I ended up back in Los Angeles working for what I now call the amalgam factories. The, the idea is you move as fast as you can and have as many chairs going as you can and make a whole bunch of money. Oh, my gosh. And I turned out to be not very well suited for that kind of mm, environment. Yeah. And that's when Diane called me. Just in time. Mm -hmm. So then you came out, and you're with her, and you're here for eight months, and then what happens that you decide to stay? I mean, you've, you've talked about the climbing and just falling in love with the place. I mean... I did. I fell in love with the place. It was climbing. It was climbing that got me to really look for where and in what situation I was going to put down mm -hmm. roots. And do you feel like that's how you met then, as you, that's how you started meeting people here was through the climbing yes. community? Yes, yes. Yes, very big yes. There was a big climbing party this week on Tuesday that I went to oh, and saw nice. people, saw climbers that I have not seen in a long time. Well, Some I, of my old climbing nice. partners. Yeah, they, I didn't realize, being a new person here, when Kim Stringfellow puts out something new on her Mojave project, I'm always very interested to see what it was. And within the last, I don't know, six, eight months or so, she put out something about the climbing community here that it goes back to the late 60s and early 70s. And it was a really interesting article to read. So I'm sure a lot of the people that are in that article are people that you know or climbed with. That's right. Yeah. That's right. This is where the climbers from the big rocks up in Yosemite would come during the wintertime because mm -hmm. those rocks were covered with ice and snow. Mm -hmm. And they would end up here. In this 33 years that you've been here, was there ever a time that you thought of leaving the desert? There was. I... Way back in the college days, when I met the husband that I was going to spend my life practicing dentistry with, we were both initiated into TM, Transcendental oh. Meditation, mm -hmm. and I've been meditating since. It's a big part of my life, maybe, maybe even bigger than climbing. However, there was a period in early 2000s when the TM community, the headquarters is in Iowa, 
was recruiting, was requesting people who have been initiated and practicing meditation for some time to come to the headquarters mm. and sit in what are called the domes. Now these domes are not the kind of domes you find out here in the desert. These things are, they would easily seat many thousands of people. Wow. There's two of them, one male, one female. And they were introducing, they were bringing into being a dome-centered group meditation for the purpose of creating a coherence in the place where the domes mm. are located that would then radiate out into the country. It was called Invincible America. Mm. And if you went to Invincible America, they would pay you to meditate. What? Yes. <laughs> Wow. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Can I go there now? <laughs> I was I was not working anymore as a dentist and I thought this is perfect. Mm -hmm. Another opportunity that right. I can't I can't turn down. So I went to Fairfield, Iowa, which is where the headquarters are. They own a university there called MUM, Maharishi University of Management. And they have a lot of very credible degrees, mm -hmm. degree programs inclu including business degrees. Also organic farming mm -hmm. and a computer, a lot of computer stuff. They also have on the side all this meditation. Everybody in the school meditates. There's wow. an elementary school, a high school, and then on into college, one fluid education system there. Mm -hmm. So that's where I ended up for a year. Mm -hmm. what, would, what did it feel like there? Did it feel different to you because there were that number of people meditating. meditating and that collective consciousness, I would imagine, just I believe, really... I believe, it, I believe it did influence the, the feeling, mm. the emotional core of the village. The town was about the same size as Joshua Tree, about 8,000, okay. 8 to 10,000. And half of them were farmers and half of them were meditators. And the farmers called us ruse, as in gurus. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and it was kind of a cordial yeah. getting together. They didn't mind us being there. They found us to right. not be uh, reprobates or mm -hmm. uh, un unwelcome in any sense. We were definitely good for the economy. Yeah. A town of 8,000 had 32 organic restaurants. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> like every other building was an organic restaurant. And, and everybody went out to lunch. Everybody went out to lunch. That is an economic driver. Wow, food and meditation. I think I need to sign up somewhere for that. <laughs> My gosh. It's a very mellow town. I got there with no place to land, and so I called... I, I let it be known to all my friends, including my friends in Venice. And one of them said, well, I have a friend who lives in Fairfield. He's not a meditator, but he does have a spare bedroom. And so he hooked me up with a place to land for temporary. Wonderful. And he was... Bruce. Springsteen's roadie, one of Bruce Springsteen's roadies, and he told me that he retired from being a roadie because of the sense of being in the town, what it felt like. Oh, that's interesting. I thought so. Yeah, that's really I cool. Thought so he's probably still there. Probably. Are you still involved with Transition Joshua Tree? I am peripherally. I just went to their Death Cafe last month. Oh, talk about that, because I've seen it advertised. Yes, let's talk about it. There is sort of an obvious lack of depth in our culture when it comes to discussing death or being around death, being comfortable with death, bringing death up in a way that is conversational. So this is a movement. I'm not sure where it came from, but mm. you can find Death Cafe as a thing on Google. Okay. And Transition Joshua Tree brought that to town, and they used to have more of them. I guess they're having more of them now because I just saw that there's another one coming up this month. Right. It's almost been like once a month for, I want to say, the last two or three months. And yeah. there was a time when it was once a month for, I'm thinking, a whole year, and then they took time off. They let Death Cafe go into hiatus for a while. Now it's back. Okay. And the last... Last month when I went, it was my first mm -hmm. to experience uh, Transition Joshua Tree's cafe. It was very interesting. Cool. Can you talk a little bit about Joshua Tree, uh, rather Transition. Transition Joshua Tree in the general sense, and then the permaculture, it seems that you were involved with that part. Transition is an international movement. It started in Totnes, England, and I met mm -hmm. Rob Hopkins. He came to the States and toured the States, and I met him when he was in Los Angeles. He's the guy who wrote the book. Uh, it's about l looking ahead and finding a way to take care of ourselves, a way to create a soft landing from what looks like 
uh, societal collapse at some point when we can no longer sustain ourselves because mm -hmm. we can't get water, we can't get electricity, we can't govern ourselves. There's not going to be any big body that shows up to take care of us. Mm -hmm. So that's what transition was dreamt up to fill, to, to, to have in place so that we don't end up without anything. We have something in place that helps hold us together and cooperate. Some kind of minimal infrastructure, if you will. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Some, some kind of knowing who has chickens with eggs. How do you build this, for example? And there's a lot of information like that in the books about transition. And so you get together with your neighbors mm -hmm. and you put together a transition movement for your neighborhood. I was part of that. Jill Gigrich was the one who brought the information to town. She'd been in France where she saw a transition working wow. in villages in France. So she brought it back here and she says, okay, who wants to help me do this? Right, and, I, in. and I stepped up and I was part of, I was a very active part of transition for the, about the first four years. And then I moved away from the governance part of transition. We finally got our legs under us and people stepped forward and said, we need to have an elected board, which was exactly what was supposed to happen. That was sure. our design. We didn't have any more of those of us who had set ourselves up as leaders. We had a, an elected group of people to do that. And I backed off into the team that's called Heart and Soul. And I was very active in Heart and Soul for a number of years, writing the norms, writing the proposals, getting the groups off the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went back to school. This is just recently. This is brand new stuff. I went back to school and the school was going to take up all my time and I wasn't going to be able to participate in Heart and Soul. Mm -hmm. I expect to go back to heart and soul when I get my credential and I get busy working. What are you going to school for? I will be a health coach. Okay. Which is a brand new profession, and most people wouldn't be able to tell you what a health coach was, but a health coach is a, a partner and a change maker. Mm -hmm. We are educated in functional medicine and how the, the business of how to get people to change which is pretty complicated. Mm. You can't give them information, it, telling them right from wrong, and expect them to carry on and right. do, what, do what's good for them. There's a whole business of motivational interviewing and learning mm. how to detect where they are and how to get the pivot point a little mm. bit closer to them. What inspired you to do that? My own poor health. I was, mm. I had considered myself my avocation, my... My love when I get to spend time by myself is baking, was mm. baking. And it turned out that the things I was using in my baking habits were really bad for me. <laughs> yeah. It was hard for me to admit that. <laughs> but sugar and flour are just really hard on your system. They're mm -hmm. not good for you at all. Mm -hmm. And I found it the hard way. My uh -huh. health crashed. And so getting myself back into healthy habits became a motivation for me to want other people to have those opportunities to nice. know health and not get sick. Right. And sometimes spreading the word about something good is a good thing for us to do. So that just makes sense all the way around. So when do you finish? June. I'm taking clients now. Great. I just started with my first clients this last month. Wonderful. And so, yeah, I'm hitting the road. Not at a dead run, but I'm getting there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it takes time. Yeah. You have to build up some credibility and, and some business savvy right that's a third track we have the change making track mm -hmm. the functional medicine track and the creating a business that works track wonderful if someone were interested in finding out more about that where is there a name of the school or the school is Cresser Institute okay C-R-E-S-S-E-R uh, K-R-E-S-S-E-R -E Chris Cresser Chris, Chris and Chris Cresser is a pretty well known name he has a huge um, blog following Mm -hmm. um, and knows all things good for health. You can find, you can Google on his, or you can do a search, there's a search engine on his site, and you can find out anything you are interested to learn about how to improve your health. Great. I am so grateful to have you here today. I know we met several months ago, and I'm glad that I kept up trying to reach out to you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that happens sometimes. So, sure. so thank you very much for being You're here. So I appreciate it. So 
We're going to move into the exclusive content portion of the podcast where Karen is going to pick four numbers between 1 and 50. I will read what those questions are. And then if you're interested in hearing Karen's answers to those questions, you can find those at patreon.com slash desertladydiaries or go to desertladydiaries.com and click on the support page and you can find out all the information of how to become a patron of Desert Lady Diaries and get that exclusive content. So I need to write these numbers down because I won't remember them. So four numbers between 1 and 50. 2, 22. My birthday. <laughs> Coming up? March. 25. <laughs> okay. That's three. Right, one more. 47. 47, okay. You find a $100 bill on the ground. What do you do with it? The another question will be, since coming to the desert, what have you been surprised to discover about yourself? The next one will be, how would your best friend describe you? And then the last one will be, what do you think about when you're alone in your car? If you want to hear Karen's answers to that, go out to desertladydiaries.com, click on the support page, and meet us over in Patreon land. Thanks again. So how about that naked roller skating business? Do you have a favorite naked sport? Share it with me and our community of listeners on the Desert Lady Diaries Facebook page. Or if you prefer to remain anonymous, shoot me an email to desertladydiaries at gmail.com. I'll tell the story, but I'll keep your confidence. If you'd like to hear Karen's answers to the questions she chose for Diary Unlocked, the episode is available over at the Desert Lady Diaries private podcast on Patreon. Diary Unlocked is available exclusively to Patreon supporters for $5 per month. Check it out at patreon.com slash desertladydiaries or learn more about it by going to desertladydiaries.com and clicking on the support page. It shows you how you can support through Patreon or just through PayPal using your debit or credit card. And I do have a shout out this week for Rhonda. D, thank you very much for your support of the podcast through Patreon. I really appreciate you, Rhonda. And if you're enjoying this podcast, I hope you'll spread the good word and share it with a friend or take two minutes right now and write a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you're listening from. Thanks so much for listening.